Now, 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 did you really think that I could stay all cute and cuddly and not cover X-Men on this channel? No, I, I could do my little indie book here, my little alt comic here, blah, 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 hugs and kisses, but no, at the end of the day, this is what I read every week, so it is, it is how I do it. We are deep in the fall of X-World. In fact, we're so deep in the fall of X-World, I'm getting tricked. I'm getting tricked into, well, that one doesn't even say fall of X, but it should. Getting tricked into buying things like fucking Deadpool. Well, we'll get to this right here. Said fall of X, I go, well, I'll read that one. You know, I should have known. It's not on the backs of any of these, you know, the, the what you should read next little lists and stuff, but I should have known. And then we're going to find out that Iron Man, uh, that Fall of X is really just tricking us uh, X-Men fans into, into delving into at least a little bit some of the other Marvel Universe that's happening. Uh, Jean Grey, it's not even, she died. Uh, but then she has her own book. It's going to be a little bit like Iceman where it's like, well, there's this way that we could do it. And then Realm of X where we go, hey, it's Fall of X. Let's completely just do a whole storyline somewhere else. Fall of X made them do this. And now they're just doing something completely different. And that's what we're in today. So Alpha Flight. Very excited to see an Alpha Flight book was coming out. I think it might be a... I think it might be a... Miniseries, unfortunately. Probably through this sort of Fall of X. Um, I think we're going to call it an initiative. Uh, this is not an event in itself. I guess it's an event because they all have these little things on them, right? But there isn't a... There isn't really a, a an event book coming out or anything. What it is is... Hey, we've set the stage. This is the situation for mutant dumb, and now go tell stories with them in that situation. Even if you time travel out or you go to a different universe or whatever, and then the main ones, the X Men and stuff, will will focus on that. Alpha Flight is one of those ones connected to the main story. Uh, you know, we have the essentially what is the Canadian X Force, let's call them. Maybe not as violent as them. But we're showing, uh, we show Alpha Flight um, trying to do uh, something somewhat utilitarian. I guess I'm going to use that word more. I used to use a different word, but somewhat utilitarian. They're going to go and help uh, the ones that aren't mutants. They're going to go and help gather up the mutants um, just because it's, it's the right thing to do. And it is what it is, and we made our decision. And so we get ourselves in this situation where it's Alpha Flight on Alpha Flight crime because some of them are mutants. Um, and then we find out at the end, essentially, that the entire time the non-mutant section of Alpha Flight was working with the mutant section of Alpha Flight the whole time. And they're in, they're in, uh, you know, they're working with Orcus on the down low. So, and here we can see it. Department H is about to deploy box sentinels. It's only a matter of time before they find you and discover we've been working together. We need to move every mutant um, here off Earth as soon as possible. And who knows, maybe that's Mars. We'll see where they go. So, Alpha Flight, Alpha Flight is sort of a side story connected to this wider, wider thing what's happening where Orcus is, is actually somewhat in control. Uh, it is an X book, at least, and it's a little bit of a throwback book. Let's uh, let's do an Alpha Flight story in the context of this Krakoan and Fall of X storyline. So, very happy with it. It was fun. It was a good read. Um, if you must have, uh, pardon the pun, X books uh, for this office, uh, then I'm glad Alpha Flight is one of the minor ones that I get to read. Now, here's what they're really doing. Uh, I figured out the plan, guys. So there's an uncanny Avengers. So the X-Men and the Avengers, they're mixing in together again. We get we get the X-Men who, you know, I guess our audience, the X-Men audience is like, separates themselves a little bit from the major, the main Marvel heroes world, which are only popular in movie form. Um, and, and so what they're doing is they're getting this audience, they're forcing this audience that they know, they know we're suckers. They're just, for, they're getting us to buy books with, uh, the main the mainline superheroes in them. So Invincible Iron Man is important in the uh, and I, I probably should be reading ahead of number nine. I haven't read any of it. Um, there's been Orcus stuff. There's been stuff with um, uh, this dude whose name slips my mind. Uh, new owner, the mutant hating industrialist. Oh yeah, Fei Long. I should remember his name because he was a that Bruce Lee wannabe character in Street Fighter: The New Warriors, which he was awesome. But um, 
So yeah, we're in the middle of all this. This is most of the story on how the Sentinels became giant Iron Man happened here. Um, uh, uh, the uh, White Queen, Emma Frost, has had a big part here. We're also going to get a marriage that is a political, going to be like a sort of a political plan marriage between them. Um, and uh, so I jumped right into the middle here uh, where I got uh, a little bit of Emma Frost and Tony Stark and sort of what they've been doing together. Uh, Emma still looks hot. She doesn't like being trapped inside of the um, Iron Man suit. Obviously, Tony Stark did that to save her or help her in some way. And um, and yeah, so I got sort of dipped into this Iron Man story that I'm reading because Emma's in it. It has a little bit of like the corporate intrigue, more or less, that you would think. I don't know when the last time I read an Iron, comic would, an Iron Man comic would be. Of course, like, it feels like every time I do read an Iron Man comic, there's some reference to his drinking. I need to drink again. No. I must be stronger. Emma's wearing her uh, usual sexy outfits. Good for her. That's important to fight crime in, in that. Although, a little bit of a... Is this a, is this a jump in time? Oh, yeah, this is a jump in time. I would say a little bit of a what I would call a Claremont mistake here. It always happens where they have different clothes on, but there is a clear jump in time here. And uh, we're going to get married here. So I actually was intrigued by this. So in the sense of you know Marvel trying to get me and introduce X-Men into the, um, you get me to buy some like more Marvel books that aren't Hulk and Ghost Rider, which are like the same book essentially. But um, uh, I guess it's worked because I really did like this issue. Of course, it's written by uh, Jerry Duggan, who's doing uh, X-Force and a bunch of other stuff. So it, it, he was already sort of wanting to connect it, I'm sure. And then we get a connection to the, uh, what was it, Empire? No, it wasn't the Empire crossover. I forget which major Marvel crossover it was. The great story about Kingpin and Emma's past uh, was in that. And we're going to get a connection to that. And Kingpin has now uh, been written out of Daredevil and is now has been a uh, a more of a X-Men character over the last four or five months. So very cool. He's looking for Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary is separated from his love Kingpin and he, she's in this book now. We'll get to that. Next up is Deadpool. So hey... Says Fall of X. Uh, I, I normally put this back. You know, I tell my comic shop to give me all the X-Men books. And I normally just go sit it back down, uh, the, the Deadpool book. I've thought about it, but hey, I got a lot of books to read. I'm behind. I know Deadpool isn't fully connected. But I'm not the brightest crayon in the crayon box. I'm not the brightest crayon in the color pencil box. So uh, I didn't flip through it. And I go, well, it has this. So surely I should read it. And actually, the worst thing could happen in this, and not that the book wasn't fun or anything, and I like Alyssa Wong. She is a uh, longtime writer now for uh, Dr. Afra. But uh, I got the last part, I got the last part of a story arc, uh, of a story arc I wasn't reading. A bunch of characters I don't know, uh, which Alyssa Wong does add. She just adds fuck tons of characters in her books. I mean, I'm only comparing this one issue to what I read in, in, uh, in Dr. Afford, where there's just a bunch of side characters. So, I mean, good for her. She's giving free ideas over to Marvel. But, um, so the book was cool. You know, there's a demon, Daredevil's funny, blah, blah, blah. So, pretty basic. You know, White Page is still in these Daredevil books, but it had nothing to do with uh, the fall of X. In fact, it doesn't even feel like what happened in the, the gala happened uh, at this point. So, there we go. There's a symbiote dog here, which I thought was pretty funny. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't be against reading this Daredevil comic from the beginning, but uh, it was cute, and it might even be the end. It might be the end of her run. So like, let's try to get this last issue of Daredevil some or Daredevil Deadpool some uh, a little bit more sales. Let's just slap the Fall of X thing on here, even though it doesn't fit at all. And then only for Deadpool, Venom Annual. That's funny. Only for Deadpool. I wonder what this is about. Uh, only for Deadpool do we get the regular X-Men backing where Deadpool is in there. So, Anyway, that was a little bit of filler. So, Jean Grey. I, when this came out, I go, well, what are they going to do with Jean Grey? Let me give you a quick, not synopsis, because I don't care. It's basically a quick um, explanation of uh, a reminder that I don't like Jean Grey. I don't think she's a great character. I think she keeps spinning out of one storyline nonstop. And writers need to stop doing it. This is the Phoenix, by the way. It's a good cover, but nonetheless. She probably has other stories. 
that no one's touch on, and then even when they do give her her own stories, they just connect her to the Phoenix again. And that's what's happening here. Uh, there is one little twist here that we'll, we'll talk about. So let's, uh, let's get to it. She dies. She dies during the Hellfire Gala. Uh, as maybe you know, or I, you know, I covered. Um, but uh, then we get, we get a Jean Grey book. Same thing happened to Iceman. Iceman died, or it looked like it. And then we get sort of a really disconnected reasoning for Iceman living. Which is fine, that happens, and maybe the book will be good, and we'll just live with his sort of, like, essence or whatever. But this Jean Grey book is, uh, in, in, in the spirit of, of taking from X-Men's convoluted history and making it more convoluted, even when they've resolved some storylines, uh, they do that here. And it's great. Like, why not? I, at this point, I'm just all in on convoluting the X-Men storyline. So before Hickman came around, they had a big little, like a, not a big crossover, but a little, a little crossover, a little storyline running where they sent back um, the original X-Men that have come back in time. Now, this happened a long time ago. I didn't read these books. I just know about them. Uh, it's one I definitely wasn't reading X-Men, probably like in the 2012 time frame or, time frame or something. But um, there's a storyline that just kept going where Beast showed up to the past. This version of Beast. This is before he's like, not before, he's been evil on and off or questionable. But this is one of his questionable decisions. And he goes back to the original X-Men. He wants to bring those original X-Men to the present um, to basically help out with what's going on and to uh, remind the X-Men who they really are. Blah, blah, blah. Like the original idea. And uh, these X-Men... The young X-Men get stuck in the present. And so at first they, they weren't sent back. They were trying to send them back. And then now uh, when they finally did get sent back, it was like basically an alternate reality or whatever. This story is not about the version of Green Jean Grey that we saw die in, in the Hellfire Gala. This version is about the Jean Grey that got taken in you know the 2020-12 issues had a bunch of present time continuity, all five of the X-Men did. In fact, Iceman, the young Iceman, and the you know, the now gay Iceman, not now gay, but out of the closet Iceman, you know, had a bunch of interactions and realized important stuff. There's a lot of storylines spun out of it. Before Hickman take o took over, they uh, were convinced to go back, or they were convinced just to get sent back into the 60s or whatever. This is their story, which was supposedly closed. This is their story reopened. And Jean, that Jean, that younger Jean that's a little bit older, a few years older, um, basically overdoing it. Using, this is a good, what this ends up being, and the book ended up being good, um, is basically a parable. Is like, oh, they know what their future holds and some of the threats that are coming. So this basically becomes a parable of what happens if someone powerful like Jean, or if a, lot, a question a lot of people have about the X-Men with all of their psychics and stuff is why don't they just change people's minds why don't they just affect things why don't they just do this do that gene actually does this here and it has um extreme what i will call like monkey paws consequences through it and as an issue number one it was actually uh, pretty good because gene basically becomes um uh, evil in her own way like she wipes xavier's mind out they know they they know to avoid the phoenix in that first Dark Phoenix saga. So in this timeline, there's no more Dark Phoenix. Um, you know, different people and different X-Men get killed. The X-Men sort of break up in a little bit. The original five. They don't know really how to react to what's going on. Um, Professor, They leave Professor X. They end up wanting to do their own thing. So a lot of just crazy stuff sort of happens. Um, you know, to the point where Jean says, I'm not a monster. But she's just gotten so deep into... Uh, basically using her powers uh, to fix people's minds or to even uh, wipe them in the case of Magneto and stuff that it just gets out of hand. Uh, and then you had this good story and then the fucking Phoenix shows up. It's like, just continue on. She avoided the Phoenix. Give me a Gene story. Even if it's not the Gene from the freaking Hellfire Gala, you had to fit in the Phoenix. The Phoenix is stupid. The original Phoenix, Dark Phoenix is stupid too. So I start from there. Maybe you love the Dark Phoenix uh, storyline. Maybe you love that original Claremont storyline. I know most of you guys do that like X-Men. 
But certainly, every gene story involving the phoenix for the last 40 years has gone too far, right? You had a good story with Jean, not Professor X, overusing her powers in a, a very unique setting, which is the young X-Men going back, but then having all of the experience of the present. They know that great setting, very interesting. You had to do the fucking Phoenix. You just had to connect her to the stupid Phoenix. So anyway, so obviously Jean's evil. There's a new dark, a new dark Phoenix story, guys. Like, God damn, you know? Uh, you had to do it. It could have been, it could have been good. Uh, you had to go, you had to go, you had to go basic bitch on us, you know? So, and it's not Jean Graham calling a bitch, it's the Phoenix. Um, so whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm still going to read it. Can we do that? The cover's cool. Her fire hair. Anyway, Realm of X. And so, uh, Realm of X, this is number one, awesome cover, Stephanie Haynes cover, or Hans, I don't know. Uh, I keep, uh, I think one time I did find out how to actually pronounce her name, and I've forgotten since, uh, since Di ended, what she was doing interiors. Uh, hopefully she does all the covers for Realm of X number one, so uh, I thought this was a very, very, very cool cover. She's one of the few people that, that uh, does very clear digital touches that I still think are wonderful. So, uh, here's the Stephanie Haynes cover. Anyway, Realm of X, and then inside, at least at the beginning, and this is an artist I didn't know, so I, when I first flipped through these pages, I went right to it. So it has like a, a Bilkless Elvi feel, or Evely feel, um, and it's an artist I don't know, so very excited about that. So uh, Diogenes Neves, so probably, probably a foreign artist from... Uh, Eastern Europe or something that Marvel's underpaying. That's sort of what they do. Um, anyway, <coughs> uh, I got that feel, uh, you know, so their pages, their first pages here were very colorful, like uh, maybe not exactly. There's a lot of difference and stuff. So um, uh, an artist I'm going to look out for. So uh, hopefully they put them on a bunch of different books or whatever, but it's actually a good time to find those kind of artists and they do put them on like you know, fifth level, sixth level X-Men books. I, I do find a lot of good art in those, or at least interesting or different art. I don't always like it, but it's like, oh, this is, they're giving this artist a run and it's big enough on a big enough book, which is something like a Realm of X or, uh, you know, Dark X-Men or something like that. So this book is the epitome of, hey, we set up a, we set up a, a, a big action. Uh, in this case, the Red Wedding sort of, uh, story that happened in the Hellfire Gala, and now you can spin out the main story, or you can just spin out uh, its own story. Magic ends up in Vanaheim with a bunch of minor characters uh, that are actually pretty damn cool, to be honest. So in this book is Magic, whose powers don't work. That was a big thing Orcus did. Uh, you know, and part of Orcus's plans is that the people that can teleport large swaths of people at once couldn't. Uh, weren't able to do that. Magic was one, and um, and then uh, in the book, in the Rogue, the Rogue Gambit book, Destiny said that she really needed, um, I forget his name now, his name's not Portal, but really needed, it's a mutant character that's mostly Avenger, he stays away from mutant stuff, but he is a mutant, that's where his powers come from, and he does the big Portal thing too. And Destiny, who can tell the future, really wanted him. And that was just a storyline in Rogue and Gambit. And it turns out that what she needed, even though she couldn't see it clearly, was a big teleporter to be at the gala that Orcus didn't know about. And so same with Magic. So she's in Vanaheim. She loses her powers. We also have Mirage, Typhoid Mary, Dust, Marrow, Curse. So Kingpin's out to find Typhoid Mary. So eventually, um, you know, eventually what Kingpin's doing in the X-Books will mix in here. And, uh, and you get this, like, basically this... Thor crossover, even though Thor's not in it, but it is like these Thor type Thor characters and stuff. So, um, you know, these four, not magic, are are uh, some part of some part of a prophecy, and magic's not. And then here's curse. She curses. She curses people. People get fucked up around her. She's had some interesting storylines. I don't know enough about her really to get into it. I would feel sort of weird if I if I did and I didn't exactly go study her. Uh, beforehand, but I, I've read a lot of books with Curse in there, and it's like she's a character who's uh, the nature of her powers um, could take over a book. You know what I mean? So you, you have to be careful with her. Uh, basically, passes around bad luck, almost like the opposite of Domino 
in some ways. But anyway, we get magic stuck in a fantasy realm that isn't limbo, which is cool. It isn't like that isn't like some sort of um, hellscape. Uh, it's very much a very much a a Thor. Uh, influence sort of book, except with mutants in it. You know, I was trying to read this at during my lunch break, and uh, you know, I want to eat lunch too and read and take my time. It's like, oh, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read, I'm behind on X Men, I'm gonna read a comic real quick, and then you get to like these these giant pages that just aren't written that well, to be honest. Sometimes they are, but you know, it, th this comes from the spirit of uh, Jonathan Hickman, who mostly did charts and mostly did. And I know people still didn't like him, but I did. And he mostly did uh, very nicely graphically designed charts. And these other writers just continue to just do walls of text. You know, so... And they're not that good, to be honest. These writers are a lot better at this. You know, sometimes it's a fucking email. I, c I complain about that all the time. Anyway. So, uh, we're right, right in the middle of a, a big X-Men fantasy story. Uh, Typhoid Mary is very cool, by the way, in this book. And... Uh, magic doesn't seem to be acting like magic to me, but we'll see. It's just the beginning, and she's sort of dealing with her, like, powers not working and stuff. Um, and we're getting, like, into the thick of it as far as, like, the world building and what's happening <coughs> in the context of um, this war that's happening between the White Witch and these characters in Vanaheim that knew of a prophecy then it involved a bunch of minor X-Men characters, which is pretty cool. It turns out, though, that this we will connect this to the world of Excalibur in some way because it, it's Saturnine, who had a big part in the uh, Ten of X story, or X of Ten of Swords story. So Saturnine is gone. Uh, she's acting pure evil here. She used to be just, like, ironically evil, <laughs> but she's looking pure evil now. And uh, she's able to get uh, hold a curse and will try to... Um, harness curses powers clearly. So there we go. We got a little realm of X. Uh, I always want a good magic story because I love magic. One of my favorite characters, definitely a top five character, maybe number one. Um, so I'm interested in that. She sort of got second billing when she joined the X Men. You think, oh, she's in the main X Men team? Yes, but no, she would. Uh, she got like a little bit uh, too much second billing, even though she's a great character. And that's what we got. But guys, we did a we did another X Men show. I mean, we did another X-Men show. We even did a little Deadpool and we did a little Invincible Iron Man here. So there we go. Let's see what we do next. Let's see if it's only Fall of X again. I know the Magneto story is out there. I do want to start reading some Sylvester uh, X-Men from the uh, late 80s and stuff. So anyway, thanks for hanging out. I'll see you guys next time.